Welcome to the Mindful Millennial Podcast, where host Seth Marcus dissects and discusses all things impacting the millennial mind. Mentors, peers, and professionals share intimate conversations on subjects such as entrepreneurship, exercise, and health, the blessings and curses of technology, travel, and how to navigate adulthood in this age of information. We're the largest generation in history, and we dictate the future. The Mindful Millennial finds a signal through the noise. Today's episode is with Lindsay Gonzalez. Lindsay is a Denver-based yoga teacher in search of adventures both on and off the mat. She is known for her keen understanding of breathwork practices, body alignment, her sense of humor, and her ability to empower her students to live fully. Lindsay's teachings have taken her all over the world. Her pairings of yoga and board sports have propelled her to international recognition. When not teaching, Lindsay spends her time surfing, skateboarding, stand-up paddleboarding, and hiking with her pup. She is also publishing her first ebook, The Art of Hands-On Assists, which will be available later this year. I met Lindsay at a yoga festival in 2011. We became fast friends and have maintained that relationship through both of our busy travel and work schedules. We don't see each other often, but when we do, we dive right into great conversations accompanied by random acts of silliness. We met at my house and shared a ketogenic lunch, which both of us have been experimenting with this year. Our interview touches on meditation, cooking, the value of personal time, and nesting versus travel. I loved this interview, and I hope you do too. So, Lindsay Gonzalez. <laughs> we always, I turn it on right after we, you just make a silly. <laughs> All right. Well, welcome, everybody. <laughs> this is the Mindful Millennial, and my name is Seth Marcus. I'm with Lindsay Gonzalez today. Say hello, Lindsay. Hello. Lindsay is uh, a very close friend, and she is a absolute beast. She's a multi-athlete. She's a teacher of teachers, and she's also one of the best friends I've ever had. Yeah. <laughs> we just had a fantastic lunch. We did a ketogenic lunch. We're both doing ketosis right now. And we took some blood. Mm. We <laughs> And, you know, one thing that I realized today was that I start going with my friends and then we have our conversation off the microphone before we actually get on the microphone. So that's kind of uh, what we're doing is we're getting back into it this time. We're going to try to revisit some issues and talk it through. I think I want to start with a story that you told me a few years ago that I just absolutely love. And I, I brought it up a few times when we hang out, but you used to tell me about how angry you would get with your parents or with a boyfriend and you would just like as a ritual oh, drive yeah. straight to <laughs> drive right to the beach i believe baltimore right yeah i was living in annapolis at the time and i would drive out to uh ocean city maryland mm -hmm. and why don't you just walk us through that little, well that, this that... will age me quite a bit because this is back in the time of beepers <laughs> so my my mom would be beeping me and i had the kind of the nicer beeper where she could send a message and it would say where are you or come home now and i'd be standing there on the beach looking at my bright blue beeper and just hurl it into the ocean <laughs> multiple times <laughs> so so what i remember distinctly about this story is not that she threw it into the ocean but more that how many times oh you yeah do it. <laughs> yeah i was totally littering <laughs> have you did you ever like go back out to the beach and just find an old an old pager just no, sitting, sitting somewhere on the beach. Or when they like went into the ocean, they were gone forever. Yeah. And that was like the, the ceremony of letting go of that conversation or that command from my family. <laughs> <laughs> and I am embarrassed how many times I did it. But man, it gave me a couple hours of freedom before I had to go home. It's funny how, you know, now as adults, we like try to build those types of freedoms into our world. Like, yeah. you know, I'm just gonna shut my phone off and not Lindsay, not Elgo. As she she may be referred to as Elgo for some time throughout this episode, but she, <laughs> Lindsay just basically just throws her, throws her problems into the ocean. Oh man! I think that's I think that's pretty symbolic of kind of how you live your life now. Like you've got a a very very direct mental compass where you really see see what's serving you and what isn't. And your path has always been so interesting to me. Oh, thanks. Um, why don't you tell me a little bit about where you're at right now? Like, what's really getting you excited right now? We talked a little bit over lunch, but I mean, there's always so much going on in your world. Yeah, so um, I'm getting ready to head out to travel again. So I'm I'm really excited about going back to Bali, teaching another 200 hour teacher training there, and then heading down to Australia. So this is spring, and spring is the beginning of my travel season. So that has me going completely. 
And uh, I'm excited to check out some new places and see how Bali has changed in a year and meet new people. So that's kind of the biggest thing. And then there's another piece, of course, that starting in November of last year, so just at the end of the year, I started skateboarding. And so I've been calling myself the skateboarding yogi. And that's been so much fun because I'm 33, almost 34. And it's a, a pretty big challenge as a woman in her mid 30s to be dropping in or throwing myself off of shredding. yeah shredding <laughs> kind of <laughs> <laughs> but wearing all the pads all the time and making sure that I'm uh, just living on the edge yeah <laughs> every time I hang out with you which is not as much as I'd like I'd say what maybe three three four times a year yeah. you're not only building your yoga teaching business but also you've got stand up paddle boarding, you're surfing, you're working with some new teams and building cool products or ideas. And I just, I like, I love hearing all about it. I know about two years ago you started Breathe On Board, right? Yes. Um, yeah. Tell me how that came about and where it's heading. So Breathe On Board was a, um, a real passion project around living in Colorado and not being that close to the water. Okay. And I, I wanted to make a way that I could be on the water more often. And so I started stand up paddle boarding and ended up becoming sponsored by BoardWorks, which was a great opportunity. And with a sponsorship from them, I started to think about like, well, what can I do next? How can I make this part of my life? And Breathe On Board is stand up paddle board yoga teacher training for yoga teachers. And we do it in a two-day format, like a weekend format. And the main principle of that business is water safety for a lot of people that don't know how to manage large groups of people on the water. So I worked with a company called Paddle Fit a couple times, and I'm a Paddle Fit pro coach with them. So and I'm able to teach the safety aspects of paddle boarding, how to you know, if somebody falls off and hits their head or has some sort of injury on the water, how do you get them back to shore? And that's most of the component of Breathe on Board. And then the very small, maybe even 25% of it is actually teaching yoga on a paddleboard. Is it only available to people who have already done yoga teacher training? You know, I've opened it up a little bit. Um, Pilates, fitness, any fitness-based certification, because I know that people are doing almost like plyometrics or CrossFit style stuff on paddleboards too, because that's adding a whole nother and element stability. of stability. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cool. I still have yet to do paddleboard yoga. Oh, and so I feel nice. bad because like I have got the guru right in front of me and I still haven't been on a paddleboard yet. As a, a yoga teacher that is not teaching as much, I like I I love the aspect of customizing it for yourself because I think that doing yoga or at least becoming a teacher, you really start to it really ties that bond of like what yoga is to you and in your experience, you've just taken it and just run with it. And going into your love of the water and wanting to have something like that here in a landlocked state, that's just, I just freaking love it. So Thanks. tell us a bit about like where you're heading. Yeah, so the, the evolution of Breathe On Board is really fun. I think it's going to change a little bit over time. And now working with a team of other women, just starting to create this emphasis of board sports and inspiring actions on boards. Breathe on Board is now turning into a little bit more surf style retreats, stand up paddle boarding as kind of a gateway to get to surfing because it's uh, a lot more accessible. Um, with my history of snowboarding, snowboarding based retreats, doing uh, split boarding, Avi One course within a week, Whoa. and taking women into the backcountry would What's be so split fun. Boarding? So that's the answer to snowboarding in the backcountry. So you can skin up a mountain just like you would skin up on skis, but instead you skin up on a split board and then you attach the board back together. So it goes from skis into a shape of a snowboard. Do the bindings rotate? They do. Okay, yeah, exactly. Yeah. You got the principle and then you just ride down That's so, so you're still like honoring the the shred of boarding and uh i think that would be cool you know so we're, we're in the conversation of that and now that i've picked up skateboarding how can we make skateboarding more accessible for women so yeah yeah the the uh the breathe on board it's like i remember when you started it and you were just so into the, the paddle boarding and now it's turned into all boards yeah and that's so cool thanks i love it so one of the things i admire most about you as well as something that i'd like to talk to you about is the how you can travel and still maintain 
friendships and still have a flourishing business and still be a yoga teacher and, and feel like you're part of the community while also being part of this global traveler community as well. Oh man, that that part's exciting and hard at times. Sure. Yeah, I love being able to go away with knowing that I'll be back. And it is quite a challenge to maintain my community. But you know, I was sitting with the, the studio that I work for here in Denver. And the feedback that they gave me is my class retention is really high. And even last year, I traveled for almost five months out of the year. And that said a lot to actually sit down and see numbers because the numbers are based on who comes to my class at the beginning of the year. And then when I'm away for the spring and half of the summer, those are the same people that come back again. So I feel like in a, um, in a, in a strong way, I've actually maintained those relationships through social media. And people are excited you know, they get my newsletter once a month and I try not to overdo it too much with the information that I'm sending out to them. But social media through Instagram, Instagram stories, I'm pretty good about. And then and She's then me just now. I know, right? <laughs> and then Facebook is a, a good way to stay in touch. What advice would you give early fresh out of teacher training yoga teachers that are still trying to find their voice, their style? How, how would you guide them? Oh, gosh, that's a good question. The first thing that I would ask them to do is really think about what else they like besides yoga. Because you have to have, I use the word passion a lot, but it has to link. So for me, it was stand up paddle boarding and yoga. And that came together like really naturally. So if it's children in yoga or if it's family-based work in yoga, something else that puts a little bit of your personality into it is going to make your yoga teaching stronger. Do you find that there's studios that support that type of unique spin on, on yoga? I know some of the more corporate places are very strict about you teach this way. Like we have our parameters. Like how do you kind of fit that but also insert your own, your own personality into I it? I think I'm just a rebel. I know you're a rebel. Yeah, I'm a rebel <laughs> because my answer would be, well, why does it have to be in a studio? Mm -hmm. as, an, as an entrepreneur – I, I am a firm believer in like reach out to different communities and insert yoga into them. That will be a bigger way to spread yoga versus the confinement of a studio. Yeah. For a lot of the people that I work with one on one, they don't want to go to a studio because they feel, you know, like they're not strong enough or they don't know the yoga practice. Or I hear often like I don't meditate, therefore I don't belong. And I'm just like, no, you you do belong and your meditation is in another element of your life. So to new yoga teachers, take your yoga and insert it somewhere that it's not happening already. Yeah. That's where I, my yoga teaching has led me as well as once I did my teacher training, I was like, I have a passion for teaching men yoga Yeah, for exactly the reasons you just said is men actively avoid yoga because they don't want to look dumb. It's easy to do pull-ups or you know, go on the treadmill or whatever, but they don't want to fall over in a balancing pose. They don't want to not be able to do a handstand. You know, they, they, there's all these little barriers. And then above all, like I learned so much that men's bodies are just so much different when it comes to these yoga poses. And because of it being such a, a feminine dominated industry right now, people align a lot of the times to women's bodies and yeah. the biggest example for me is the warrior two position which for people who don't know is having one knee bent facing facing forward and the other is is diagonal on the back i'll, I'll, I'll attach a picture to the show <laughs> notes <laughs> but um the, your typical warrior two position a lot of guys hips are not open enough to put a parallel like your feet are on one line and so I like to teach to offset that a little bit so that you make sure you don't compromise your front knee a lot of people will try to fit this open flexible woman's pose when their body's just not meant for that I think that goes into teaching a lot about listening to your body and staying in your breath is the most important thing when it comes to yoga practicing yeah Oh, absolutely. You know, lately I've been uh, teaching private lessons to a couple of the Denver Nuggets players. I'm not going to say who, but um, pretty, pretty fun because I'm I'm a five foot two woman with a big personality. And these guys are like six foot seven. So their hips literally come up to my armpits. And <laughs> it's just, I just see you trying to adjust them. Oh, <laughs> yeah. And I love hands on assists and oh, it's absolutely. comical. But um, but I'm learning a lot about 
about men's bodies just in spending a lot of private time with them. And man, is it awesome to see. And working with different athletes because their hips are pretty open from pivoting on the basketball floor. But where they're limited is the torsional rotation of their mid back. So thoracic spine, all of that wow. space. That's where a lot a lot of Americans with jobs and athletes, that's the, the biggest area of tightness is right is right yeah. in, the, in the thoracic. On that note, where do you see American yoga evolving? Because we've both studied abroad as and have like a very worldly view of yoga, but American yoga is traditionally power yoga. Yeah, you know, hot classes, loud music, chaturangas. You know, where do, where do you see it going? Well, there will always be a huge place for that. I even saw, oh gosh, what was it? It was like metal yoga, you know, like rage yoga. I thought, yes, somebody's doing that. Cool. But I, I think the direction of yoga here is meditation. We're learning so much more about quiet time. And I've just been really you know, I've listened to some of the the apps like Headspace and, and different meditation apps, and I think they're great. Um, I have my own meditation practice, so I don't use them. But for somebody who's new at taking time for themselves and getting to know themselves, they're fantastic. And I think that's the direction of yoga is actually slowing down or at least finding five minutes, 10 minutes to slow down within the day and then go hit it hard. Absolutely. The true benefit of the yoga came from when I was getting started, finding my breath throughout the day, finding myself sitting up and correcting my posture just naturally because I had been doing the yoga and coming back to my breath during times of stress. Or, And I think that the meditation is absolutely what it took me three years of power yoga and some shot knees to find a meditative practice, which now is... 10x more profound than going to a yoga class at this point for me is having is having a meditation practice mm -hmm. and I just have such a huge appreciation for the Headspace app in particular because it yeah. has changed my life in the last year and a half. One of the things that I've been noticing in a lot of in a lot of yoga classes is music during the final pose shavasana. How do you feel about that? I, I just want to before I put out my opinions, I want to know how you feel about that. So. Most of my level one, two classes that I teach more beginner intermediate, I will play music because I feel like it's a, a nice uh, rhythm for the students to hear something that is familiar, but not, I don't use lyrics very often. So I think that that's a good way to go. But in my level two, three classes, I on purpose do not play any music throughout Amen. the entire class. Amen. Yeah. I love it. <laughs> I, I think I pissed it. some people off. But it's, funny. It's, it's the exact opposite for me. Yeah. I, I will have a great class and then someone will, they'll, I love, they'll cue it up. It's like, just let it all go. This is your time for stillness, you know, really just drink in your practice. And then they'll like turn up some song. I've always thought that maybe it was just me because I'm a musician and I'm always listening. And so I'll just be so drawn to the music that I'll just, I'll, I won't, I won't enter any sort of meditative state. Right. But I think between that sort of ear for the music, as well as having a meditation practice, it is, is such a reverse quality. It is so negative for me. I get I get angrier than I get the entire class when wow. I start hearing music at Javasana, which has kind of led me to picking up and leaving classes early and kind of getting in the getting in and out of the locker room before everybody before the rush simply because I know that shavasana with music is not serving me um mm -hmm. and when I've appreciated stillness so much from my meditation practice or for, from traveling and having some time away from my cell phone I almost feel a little disrespected mm -hmm. at times to have this five minutes for myself that is taken over by someone's music you know yeah, I, I feel like it's a healthy challenge to not have music during practice. And some of the students will come up afterwards and be like, wow, that was the best Shavasana I've ever had. And then others, I can see that they're a little agitated. And that's yoga. It kind of goes to show the the, um, the uncomfortableness that we have with stillness yes. in our um our culture right now. I think we've all experienced the the pregnant pauses mm -hmm. in, in conversations and how that kind of makes people's skin crawl or sitting at a, in a waiting room and not being okay with sitting there or, or communicating with someone else. It, you know, it's like, I, I need to find my phone. I need to listen to a podcast or do something, kind of keep the input coming. And in Shavasana, there's, it, it is like a, supposed to be a depletion of input. Right. And yet 
still people are wanting at least something to keep receiving into them. Yeah, it's it's weird because it's like we are constantly looking for distractions from ourselves. Mm-hmm. And I think that the direction, however, is still m- towards meditation. But I find myself on social media way more than I should be and kind of just flipping through aimlessly and mm-hmm. I, I notice it like that's not meditation meditation is a walk in the park with my dog yeah. versus you know that aimless work that I'm doing <laughs> you know when we do the when we do the meditation the idea is to let the thoughts come and to recognize them as being thoughts and to let them breathe them and, and roll them off so what I notice with meditation is I'm consistently being bombarded by all the same thoughts that I have throughout the rest of the day. The exercise is acknowledging those thoughts and letting them roll away. And people get so discouraged when they don't understand that that is the core concept of meditation. And I think that feeds into the same reason why we we twitch during Shavasana because it's too quiet Mm. or we feel inclined to get into our phones or do anything other than just be still. And I think that that's it's a problem for it, it. It leads to a lot of problems in our in our culture because we don't have time to reflect and to kind of digest what is happening around us, yeah. uh, which is what I've noticed as I've gotten deeper into a meditative practice is the ability to understand where tra- like where how your travels have changed you or how a difficult conversation impacted you. So many times we just we're so happy that we did this that we just are ready to move on to the next step, and I think that that can really cause just a, an overload on, on the stimulus never any time to make that part of our personality yeah I completely am right there with you and I started to think about meditation recently as surfing so I love surfing so there's dharana and dhyana so dharana is the concentration and what most of us don't do is we don't concentrate therefore we don't dhyana meditate, which is so interesting because the concentration is paddle, 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 paddle. And then meditation is riding the wave. And for those of you who have surfed, you don't ride waves for very long. It's like a couple seconds. I mean, 30 seconds if you're lucky and you're on the wave and you're just enjoying, 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 and then you fall off and you have to paddle again. And 90% of surfing is just paddling, concentrate, concentrate, concentrate. And then there's these moments of reward So I think that people wrap up meditation as this thing that they have to have instead of this thing that we, yeah, instead of this thing that we get to have, like we get to slide into it versus like, I need it now. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) I love having you on the show because you are are so much, you're just so (laughs) well-spoken and you're just delivering it so well. You live for like the three seconds of stillness in the meditative practice. You know, you're paddling metaphorically. Yeah through your meditative practice for 15 minutes. And then before you know it, you realize that you were still for a few minutes. And then you realize because then an inevitably a, a thought yep. comes <laughs> or, or the timer goes off or the, you know, the voice comes back in and cues you out of something. To me, it's starting to feel a little bit more like part of my training. You go to the gym and you push, you push, you push to get to that last exertion point where you're going above what you're, what you're normally at. And that's exactly what meditation is, is that you, f- you don't fight, but you train your mind to keep on acknowledging those thoughts, to keep on being like, that's a thought, and I'm going to breathe it away. That's a thought, I'm going to breathe it away. Damn it, there's another thought, I'm going to keep breathing it away. And then before you know it, you're, you've started to be able to control that. And not only during the meditation, but right now, if I'm starting to get lost in thought about you know a text that comes up on my phone, I can take a second and roll that away and come right back to where I am. And it's just so profound and it just changes your life in such a, such an amazing way. Yeah. I wanted to talk to you a little bit about all the traveling that you have coming up because yeah. not only do you just jump all over the country doing these, doing stand up paddleboard and yoga training and, and everything, but now you're continuing on that and going international later this year. Mm -hmm. So um, first things first, I'm actually going on vacation, (laughs) which I'm really excited about. So my friends and I, there's a a group of us girls that we're we're all snowboarding and surfing and skateboarding together. And we're going to Puerto Rico 
um, right after that, I go to Anguilla for another week. So I'll be bouncing around the Caribbean, which is kind of fun. And at the same time, I, I never really let myself vacation 100%. So I think I'm going to stop in and see some different spots and um, check out some retreat centers, see what I can build from there, and maybe take people to Puerto Rico with me next year. But I am excited about being back in Bali again. And then I'm really excited about being in Australia. I'll be visiting some studios in Melbourne, Albury, and in Sydney for the month of June, the last couple of weeks of June into the 4th of July. And then I fly home. And after that, I'm starting to build workshop tours throughout the U.S. So that's all kind of coming together. And that'll be up on my website schedule pretty soon. So it's just something that I, I, I like to do, I continue to do, and I know that it really feeds me to make deeper connections with people in new parts of the world. When did that start for you? What was the catalyst that got you out of being a yoga teacher here in Denver and into an international retreat, you know, where you are now? How did, how did that start for you? What gave you the motivation? I just wanted to travel. And I, I had to find a way to fund it. <laughs> and I thought, man, if I could reach out to people and just say, hey, I'm a yoga teacher. This is what I'm doing. Can I come? And the answer has always been, yeah, let's try it out. Let's see. Because I don't think there's enough people going out and, and being the entrepreneur, like I was saying earlier, and just saying, this is what I have to offer. We have to be pretty bold in ourselves and our frame of whatever it is and, you know, big inside of ourselves. So I'm five foot two and I want to be seven feet tall. So I just go and say, hey, this is who I am. Let's try it. Yeah. And people keep saying yes. So I feel like that's really the becoming the fuel for any of the fear that I need to overcome. Yeah. The... <laughs> I always forget how short you are. <laughs> <laughs> and then I give you a hug, like, hello, everybody. I'm like, oh, my goodness. I'll go. <laughs> and then, but, but it's because your personality is so large. And I think that your presence during yoga classes, your presence when we hang out and in social endeavors, like, you're, you're just, you have this, I wouldn't say showmanship, but you just have a distinct comfort to be the center of attention. And mm -hmm. I think that really is is fantastic for your yoga teaching as well as putting yourself out there asking a question and being like what is the worst that could happen you know like they're gonna say no and i'm gonna ask the next person or they're gonna say yes and i'm gonna be like all right we're going to bali we're going to puerto rico we're going to australia i think that's something that so many people are scared of yeah you know there's a lot of fear of the unknown you know i know for like myself you know oh, I shouldn't go talk to the cute girl on the other side of the of the yoga class or at the coffee shop or in the grocery store. You know, I, I shouldn't do that because I'm too scared of this, you know, this, this made up thing. Right. This girl <laughs> is going to be like, rape and yeah. spray me with some mace or something. You know what I mean? Like, like, like nothing would ever happen like that. You know, like I'm just trying to put myself out there. And I think that doing this project especially has been a, a huge, a huge step in that direction of like, we're just going to go for it. And, you know, and so far every single step of the way has been so positive and, and just another excuse to see my, my really good friends, you know, and have a good conversation and, and meet more amazing people in the process. Yeah. Yeah. I think vulnerability is so sexy, you know, like just showing up and saying, this is what I have to offer. Are you, are you into it? Mm -hmm. And I think that the more people start to find out who they are and become more comfortable in their skin, the more, the more vulnerability we're going to see in the world. And that's what keeps us moving. If we're just all sitting around and just letting go of like, I'm afraid, I'm afraid there's not going to be any forward progression. Yeah. Yeah. Life doesn't happen inside the comfort zone. Yeah, exactly. What exercises do you do in your classes or in your stand-up paddleboard or in any of the any of your programs that that knocks people out of that comfort zone? Because I've been in a few classes where where there are those types of exercises. Everything from introduce yourself to your friend to uh, assistant, you know, uh, assisting each other through inversions and things like that. What what do you? What's one of your go tos? You know, I, I don't really do a lot of shared assisting anymore because I've been working and trying to learn the world of trauma. So I want to respect people's boundaries. But 
um, be vocal. I have been getting people to sing with me, to ohm, to hear the sound of their voice. We do things like rolling ohms where I'm not necessarily the one leading, but they might be leading at their own clip. And being vocal is a, a big form of vulnerability for everyone. So I'm, I'm welcoming that in my classroom a lot. Do you have times where there are partner stuff in there when and it's just about you or is it more of like conversations between between people in the beginning of classes? How I've invited that for sure. You know, say hi, because I always it happens to me and and I notice it where I'll run into somebody at Whole Foods and, and I'm like, oh, God, I know you, but I don't know you. And it's probably that I know them from the yoga classroom. So I, I kind of make that joke like you might see them later at the gas station or the Whole Foods. So let's just say hi and not be so uncomfortable anymore. Right. Just yeah. something. The same sort of fears that I was just talking about. Yeah. is just, you know, smile. What yes. is what is going to happen when you smile at somebody? You know what I mean? Like that. Like there's nothing bad that's going to happen. I think that's a, a huge thing that you learn from traveling as well. Absolutely. You know, because you, especially if you travel alone or, or in, a, in a, a foreign area, you know, there's, you don't speak the language. So a lot of times a smile is the absolute best thing you can get. It's like a big way to break the ice. Mm -hmm. If you and, can get a smile. And music for that example. Like I, I bet yeah. that you've had plenty of experiences like singing and connecting with people who don't, you don't, you don't share languages with. Yeah. For me, it's always been, you know, I'll pick up a guitar or play a drum with somebody and the poor, you know, you're, you know, you're, you're hugging somebody at the mm. end of a, of a hangout, you know, not just kind of like, Oh, I don't, I don't know this this Peruvian woman, you know, like I, I might as well just like not look at her or something, you know, and that and being like, Oh, this is, you know, this is my friend now. And you walk away from that. One of the things that I like to ask my guests that I also, that I really would like to know from you, cause we, one of the things we didn't talk about when we were having lunch earlier is balance. Yeah. Um, you're a very high, high functioning individual. You've got a lot of things going. You're a, a lovely dog owner mm -hmm. and you've got a, a steady, steady teaching schedule. You've got this travel coming up. You've got a, an ebook that's coming that I want to talk about a little bit too. How do you find balance in that? How do you, how do you manage? Um, that's a great question. I'm asking myself that every day. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, a lot of time in nature. So I, I, I go, I wake up early. I'll go on a hike because the dog needs exercise, gets me outside, something like that. You know, I say that I'm a total introvert and I get called BS a lot on that because I would call BS. On yeah. That people don't think that I, I am, <laughs> but I am. And there are so many Friday nights, Saturday nights, the nights that people are out being social that I am unplugged at home, listening to an audio book, washing my dishes and like just meditatively doing things like that. Or now that I'm really into the ketogenic diet, cooking has become a big part of my life and it actually requires a lot of time. So I am in a, a lot of ways a, um, an introvert living in an extrovert's lifestyle. So I give little pieces of my day and my time to activities and shared interests, but then there's a lot of quiet space and that helps me to rejuvenate the balance. Yeah. I find that um, most extroverts that are living a mindful lifestyle are in your situation an introvert living an extroverted lifestyle there mm -hmm. i think that just naturally we get so much so much inbound friends and our business and and the interactions we have on a daily basis that it really oversaturates our extroverted needs because yeah. i think that at a, at a at some point you know, you want to see your friend, you want to go out there and, and go to the skate park or something like that. I think that it's not necessarily a, a, like being an introvert versus being an extrovert. It's that the American lifestyle is so extroverted. It promotes an extroverted lifestyle. So just having the, the presence to take a night off and to cook or to surf and to just be with yourself can be so rewarding. Um, mm -hmm. And I've definitely found that in the last, and probably in the last year of my life, I've, I've been doing that as well. It's not about, oh, I haven't caught up with her in a while. I haven't talked to talked to my dad yet this week or you know, all these different commitments to others. I'm like, I haven't spent time to 
to read that book that I really want to read or to, or to write my journal and to really just have some time for myself. So I think that, um, I think that there's a lot to be said in the kind of conscious introversion and booking that in your schedule. Yeah. I love that you just said that. So I, every day at seven 30 and it used to be eight, but now it's seven 30, my phone goes on do not disturb. And there's a list of people that can access me through that. They can kind of bypass it, friends and family and emergency stuff. But that is a very, very conscious decision. So when I'm at home or if I'm spending an evening having dinner with a friend, there's no interruptions. And if it's an email that comes through, I'll deal with it later or the next day. And in my schedule, I work pretty actively Monday, Wednesdays, Mondays and Wednesdays. And then I allow time on Tuesdays and Thursdays to usually go to the mountains or have meetings or have, you know, friend dates or whatever it is to fill me up a little bit more. So I I have set a really rigid calendar around when I take care of myself and when I'm active in the community of yoga and friendships. And podcasts. And podcasts now. <laughs> <laughs> well, I always, always appreciate your time. When I got back from Peru in November of 2016, I recognized that exact sort of need for silence. Um, You know, when you when you travel more times than not, your phone is not on full service, you know, rings whenever someone calls. It's it's usually a. you choose to connect somewhere at a coffee shop and kind of catch up, which just gives you that break from just constant communication. And that for me gave me that same, that need that you were just referring to of needing that stillness and not being available all the time. Um, For me, I came home and immediately turned off all my social media notifications, period, because I knew that I would look no matter what. Even, Even if I'm completely not engaged, I'll still be on Instagram at least once a day or I'll check Facebook every day or so, you know, it'll, it will get checked. It's not, it doesn't need to pull me at any one time. Um, that, and I, um, and I turned off my email notifications for the exact same reason, knowing that I'll check my email three, maybe four times a day and I will batch those and I will get back and I'll, I'll email the people back. I I will not, I'm not going to be non-responsive. It's just not going to pull me away from, my conversation with Lindsay or my, the, you know, hanging out with, with the dog or my family or, you know, the, the things that I really cherish, they're not going to always be abbreviated by a vibration in your pocket. Right. You know, I used to be really bad at responding to emails because I would just respond to things at random. And now that I've set up particular times to respond, I'll look at my reminders list or my emails and I'll set a goal. I'll say, I am going to check six things off of my list. And now I have to tell you, I'm a way better communicator than I've ever been because I had to put some parameters around it. Totally. It, it's, it's blowing my own mind. So I just want other people to try it. I know. If you haven't, if you haven't done it, just try it. Once again, it, it goes back to the uh, re- rejection therapy side of things is yeah. what is the worst that's going to happen? You know, we, we all have these smartphones in our pocket. We're always going to have a need to pull them out and look at them. And so when Lindsay and I are finished talking right now, we'll probably both look at our phones and we'll probably both have emails and texts. And, <laughs> and I will guarantee you that none of them are going to be life and death. Like we just we just missed some huge opportunity because we didn't respond immediately. Right. You know, the difference between important and urgent is something that needs to be thought of a lot because there are a lot of people who will place urgency on very unimportant things. Um, yeah. This email needs to be responded to immediately. Otherwise I can't complete this spreadsheet. <laughs> you know, like, it's like Yeah. Oh, well, man. Then there's this other thing that I've been playing with and it's, it, it's a kind of a bold set of language, but I'll explain it. Teach people how to treat you. And I sit with that a lot. I write about that a lot in my journal and my meditations because now I've let people in my community know I respond to emails mostly on Tuesdays and Thursdays. Awesome. And it's, it's amazing. It's transformative. So somebody will say, Hey, I just emailed you and they'll send, they'll send me a text. I just sent you an email. My response is awesome. I have some office hours tomorrow. I'll get back to it on Tuesday. Perfect. And it's uh, it's just allowed me that extra bit of space because I'll usually get that text message if I'm out on a hike and I'm really spending time with my dog and nature. I look at my phone regrettably you know, like, right <laughs> I looked it buzzed I looked 
but it does give me the space to also be accountable. Right. Yeah. There's something to be said about sitting down for email time and being like, wow, I just responded to 15 emails yes. in five minutes. Like, this is great. Like, I, I got it all done. It's successful. As opposed to like this all day, every day, oh, I need to respond to that. Oh, I need to respond to that. Oh, I need to respond to that. And now that I have uh, iMessage on my on my computer and I can quickly type, I just, I batch text messages and emails at the same time. So for me, it's usually, usually about 10.30 a.m. I'll text the people I need to text and email at the same time, either whether it's a response or starting a conversation. And it just feels so great to have that in my calendar, 30 minutes of overall correspondence and then back to another task yeah you know? or back to playtime <laughs> hopefully it's, bla- it's back <laughs> yeah, to playtime go have some fun <laughs> <laughs> i want to i want to ask you about this book because that's the one thing we didn't talk about before and Yay! we <laughs> we were talking about everything and i was like we're we're not gonna have anything to talk about <laughs> the microphones <laughs> so tell me about this book what is it all about oh my gosh i just got really hot in my body like the the <laughs> book is scares me because I've I've had this insecurity of being a writer. But I'm I'm a speaker and I'm a teacher and I'm in front of people all the time and I found myself just yesterday saying out loud, I am writing a book. And how much fear that takes to say like I'm not only going to tell you this, but I'm actually going to put it myself down on paper so that you can read it for years to come. Shit. <laughs> right (laughs) so i i did the photo shoot for the book yesterday and it's called the art of hands-on assist so it's all about learning how for yoga teachers teaching yoga teachers how to apply hands-on assist in the yoga classroom or in private lessons and some kind of tips and tricks for what to do in a 200 hour teacher training usually there's about six hours allotted for hands-on assist and how to do it and I got to tell you, in that teacher training format, you are learning so much that that's the one thing that will probably go in one ear and out the other. Absolutely. It did for me. Yeah. And so many teachers, new teachers, don't practice that because they don't want to harm anyone or get in their way. And Personal space issues. Right. And then the new topic of trauma issues, Mm -hmm. like trauma responses in the classroom. But on the student side of things... You're probably one of those students. I'm one of those students that when people touch me, I'm like, yes, more. I absolutely am. Yes. And I, I, I almost get resentful if I'm like, I haven't been adjusted yet. Like I was really hoping to get that supine twist adjustment. Uh. And then I'm like, she, like the teacher comes walking right up to me and then like adjust the person next to me. And I'm like, you motherfucker. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, that's the type of yogi yeah, I am. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, it's it's an interesting 50 50 you know some people really love it and i'm i'm one of them so this book is a, a nice approach to continuing your education with hands-on assist so that you can be more comfortable as a teacher and the first format the first rendition is going to be an ebook i'm self-publishing which i'm really excited about and then we'll see where what where it goes from there i have some connections in the yoga world and i i hope that it goes to print well you have my endorsement because that is something that i have always wanted to know more about and the funny thing is is you have always given me some of the best adjustments and tips of any teacher of any class i've ever been to thank you that's one of my that's that's that is the reason why i'm a reoccurring student i mean aside from us being friends you know but i love i love your your presence your voice your message behind it and then your ability to really break down a posture while not interrupting a flow you know for me you can get way too into the weeds not you, but the general proverbial, people can get way too into the the structure or the anatomy of a, of a pose and completely lose the pace of the class and or vice versa. It's all about the pace and they don't break down the posture or they don't concentrate on where their peak is. Yeah. You know, and I and so I'm really excited to see what you're going to do. Is it going to be is it going to be more visual aids or is it all going to be written is there going to be like a video aspect to it what's yeah what's the so, structure of it? so right now it's uh there's going to be some pictures in the book obviously and then links to videos on youtube so little video clips that will take you one step deeper and then the next level is 
come visit me for a workshop. I do a three-day workshop called The Art of Hands-On Assist. So that would be another way to tap into that community and then really work on the things that I mention in the book or in the private classroom with a group of 10 or 20 other people. I love it. It's yeah, so smart. Thanks. I didn't I didn't know now now I feel even more connected because like I am just getting going on this on the Mindful Millennial podcast and, and you know you're once again stepping out of your comfort zone even though I already thought that you were so far out of your comfort zone. <laughs> You're like, oh, might as well throw another one I, on there. You know? you know, I didn't really know I was going to write a book and it just kind of happened. And I think that that going back to meditation, that's the process of getting to know yourself is all of a sudden these things pop up and y- you just, you either say yes or no. And I decided to say yes to it. And here I am talking to you about it and saying it out loud and doing the video shoot. So it's, it's happening. One of the things I, I've really enjoyed in our conversation just now is you're not saying that you're trying to write an ebook. You're saying that you are writing an ebook. And I hear that so much in our in the in the rhetoric and and yeah. what and, and the communication that we have here, uh, at least in our community, where people are trying to quit their job and trying to start a new business or trying to do yoga or trying to meditate. And for me, it's just such a it's just such a cue that you're not doing it when you're trying it. You're yeah. not doing it, you know, and I've noticed that a lot. I, there's been a lot of times that I tell people that I'm trying to start a podcast and it's like, no, 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 no. Yeah. You're starting this fucking podcast and, <laughs> and you're, you're going to put yourself out there and you might fall on your face. You might have technical difficulties like we just, like we had at the beginning of this at this, or you may have some not so great episodes or you may lose your train of thought, but, it's just like a writer. If you don't show up and start writing pages, you'll never write good pages. Yeah. You know, that m- reminds me of um, I was in Costa Rica this last September spending some time with Patrick Harrington, who's the owner of Kindness Studios and just a, a real visionary when it comes to business. And at lunch one day, he said to me, I love playing the game of business. And I that has not left me. I mean, I have been sitting with that for months now because he's not saying like, I'm a successful businessman and every business that I do, you know, makes me millions. No, he's, he's literally like gambling. And I think that that's what I'm doing too. Like I'm not necessarily trying, like I'm all in. And if it fails, well, it fails. But at the same time, I'm all in. You've built such fortitude in your life, and there's so, there's so much to Lindsay that taking another jump and maybe falling isn't that scary because you you know that you've got such a skill set to be like that wasn't quite my path, and now I'm ready to go this way. And and the thing about it is that I haven't seen you fail yet. Thank you. <laughs> well, at least maybe you're really good at hiding. <laughs> <laughs> I just don't put that on social media. <laughs> right. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Lindsay, I'm really, really grateful for this time. I want to ask you, I want to ask you one of these general questions. I'm looking at this list and I didn't really cover any of them, which is exactly where I wanted it to go. I wanted it to be organic and I wanted to just get it lost in some conversation. What's your favorite stone to kill two birds with? <laughs> you know, it's so funny. I actually don't like that phrase, but I, I, I'll say it's just like birth and two babies at the same time. Because I'd rather bring life into the world right. instead of death. You want two kids? You might as <laughs> well just do it all at once, you know? I get it. That's so funny. You know, I... <laughs> I, I but I love that. <laughs> There's little phrases that I don't like, too. And it's going to be tough because I, I will admit right now, I do not like the phrase, pick your brain. Yeah. Yet, that's kind of by definition what I'm doing on this show. <laughs> so I am going to probably say that and then bite myself, you know, every time. But, um... One of the things that I always think about when I when the phrase "kill two birds with one stone" comes in is from the show Trailer Park Boys, where <laughs> where one of the characters says, "Get two birds stoned at once." Oh, that's so good. <laughs> well, I love it. But um, what is your tool? What is it that you that one thing that just like that kind of wraps up a lot of what you need to get done? Oh gosh, um, you or know anything? Yeah, it, it's probably just stopping. It's, it's actually a very conscious pause is the best way that I can make a decision. And I've had conversations and with friends, with family, with people very close to me, where if a conversation gets heated or if a, a business action starts to feel kind of unsettled and I want to be able to wrap it up, I have to say, 
I need to leave this conversation right now and I will return when I'm better prepared. Actively creating a little bit of space so that I can learn more about myself or learn more about the situation has brought me to the best decisions. So yeah, it's like birthing two babies slowly. (laughs) <laughs> we'll, we'll work on that hashtag. <laughs> I've never had kids. So I have no idea. Sorry, moms. <laughs> That's amazing. I, and I, I really respect that answer. It's something that kind of comes back to the mindfulness side of things is especially in altercations and arguments where you start to feel yourself become emotionally compromised. Yeah. And that's where you start to lose your audience or you become lost and you'll react t- completely emotionally, which yes. can either be a, a total shutdown or a total flare up and a, a temper explosion. It's one of the most common places where I come back to my breath. I've yet to try the, I need to leave this whole situation and I will come back to that. But I, I have stepped back and taken a deep breath something that I would do during my meditation practice and then come at it hopefully with a uh, less emotional baggage to what my response is going to be. Yeah. And I've never, ever regretted that, you know, that's uh you're wise beyond your years. No, oh, thank you. Thank <laughs> you. <laughs> you are. And I really appreciate your time. Um, all the, the show notes will contain any sort of Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, all the things, Lindsay Gonzalez and Lindsay. Thanks so much. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye.